Larry was saying he had to cover five chapters, and I only have to cover two verses, but uh, that's just kind of the, the jumping off point. We're going to start with those two verses and then expand from there, but that's the two verses that our class is based upon. And as I start introducing my class, we're going to have a, a prayer in a moment, but I've got four people I've asked to uh, come up and be volunteers for me, so if they'd make their way up here and sit up here on this front row here, I'm going to get them involved. Turn this on. Okay, this material was developed by Josh Kincaid. Kincaid. He was at, uh, at the time in 2013, he may still be, was at Memorial Road Church of Christ in Oklahoma City, Oklahoma. I went to school with him. Okay, Adam went to school with him. I don't know if that's an endorsement or not, but <laughs> we do have permission to use this material, and um, I just, whenever I'm teaching somebody else's material, I don't like to take credit for it, so I do make uh, a lot of adaptions sometimes, but his is material is what I start with, so... Um, and uh, we're going to be in Exodus chapter 34. So if you want to be turning to Exodus chapter 4, that's where we're going to be jumping off. But um, So I've selected four volunteers, and um, these guys are all going to be pretending like they are introducing themselves in a certain situation. My first volunteer here is going to be introducing himself like he is at his first day at work, and he's introducing himself to other people at work. So why don't you stand up and introduce yourself to everybody? All right. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's why he got chosen. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I, I just went through this process. I started um, at Intuit uh, like a month ago, right? So um, basically what they, they actually had us come on forward in front of everyone with the microphone too. So okay. um, they, you know, said, what's your name? And I said, I'm John McCarthy. And then they have this fun tradition where everyone goes, hi, John. Anyway, they do like goofy names. So you guys can all. <laughs> I think I'm hijacking his intention. Sorry, Art. Uh, so this was only supposed to take five minutes for all four of you. So. <laughs> uh, and then I would say, oh, so I have just uh, come on over from working at HP for 13 years down the street. Um, glad to be here. And they would have me say something about myself. I've got. Uh, four kids, and in my spare time, I pretty much hang out with them, and we play all sorts of games, video games, board games, just games in general. Okay, thank you. Yeah, no more. <laughs> Our next contestant, I mean, uh, volunteer, uh, is going to introduce himself like he's just met somebody new at school and just introducing himself at school. So it's always a name, I'm Blake, and then it's what's your major, usually, and I'm uh, English education, and then it's always an in interesting fact about you or favorite color, and you know what? I'm just going to go with blue and make it an easy one. Okay. Thank you. There we are. Thank you. Okay, and now our next one is like he's introducing himself to somebody he's met for the first time at church. My name is Brandon. Um, I, I grew up in the church. I'm, I'm new to the area, and uh, I'm, I'm looking for a, a church family. Church is very important to me, and, and I'm, uh, I'm excited to be here. Okay. And then our last one, um, he's going to introduce himself like it's the first time he's meeting his future in-laws. Uh, <coughs> James, uh, oh, I forgot my other ones. <laughs> That's pretty natural for meeting yeah. in-laws. Yeah. I mean, you kind of do. It's the deer in the headlights look. But <laughs> oh, I thought it's here. No, I don't remember. Yes, I have a job. <laughs> can't think of a third one. Okay, <laughs> that's good. That's good. Thank you. Okay. So, what did we notice about how we introduce ourselves? Posture? Okay. Almost everybody included their name. What else? What categories do we tend to include? Our interests, okay. Maybe ages in some instances. Um, occupations. <laughs> background. How, um, family, okay. Yes. Something positive about ourselves. Yeah, we don't want, 
We don't want to air our dirty laundry. No, that's right. Um, if it's church, maybe about your congregation where you serve, um, maybe might include hobbies, um, but those are some of the common elements. What are some other methods or devices that we could introduce ourselves besides just talking into a microphone? If you're applying for a job, what might you use? A resume. If you already have a job and you're introducing yourself to a prospective customer, how might you introduce yourself? A business card, okay? So those are all ways that we might do that. Um, if you work for a large organization, you might be introduced by the photo ID that you wear around your neck or, or on your shirt, okay? So in our study tonight, we're going to let God introduce himself to us. And that's why we're starting with just those two verses is because that's the place where God introduces himself to us. So let's begin class with a prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your many blessings. We thank you for this time that we have in the middle of the week that we can draw encouragement from one another as we study from your word and as we learn more about you. We pray, Father, that we can take these lessons that you have told us something about yourself and we can learn more about how we can serve you by the type of God that you are. We pray all this in your son Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so there is a category of writing called theology. Theology literally means words about God or writing about God. This is not going to be a theology class, okay? Theology class is something where some man has written something about God. What we're looking at is what God says about God. And to me, that's very important. If we want to know God, I think it's best to go, and I'm not just talking about what the Bible says about God, but where God is actually quoted as saying something about himself. And the person he says that to is Moses, and we're going to look at that in just a minute. But um, if you were to go to Amazon on your smartphone and look up the word theology, I did it a long time ago, and I got like 130,000 hits. I did it today, and I got 60,000 hits. I don't know what that says, unless it's one was with a computer and one was with my cell phone, and it kind of was limited. But there are lots of things written about God. There's lots of interest in God, and that's God with a big G, God with a little G. It's believers. It's non-believers. People have an interest in knowing more about God, or there wouldn't be so much written about it. But what we're doing in this class is not looking at what man has written about God, but we're going to be looking at what God says about God. Uh, many of us are probably familiar with the statements of Aristotle and his followers about God. He wrote the, I like to call them the omnis, you know, that God is omniscient, all-knowing, that God is omnipresent, present everywhere. And I always mess this one up because I call it omnipotent instead of, instead of omnipotent, but omnipotent is um, all-powerful. So that, you know, those are all true about God, but God doesn't say those same things about himself. Now then, if I were to have the class that has their cell phones here, and I don't think I'm going to have time to do this because we went more than five minutes on this one up here, John, but <laughs> if you were to take your, your phones and get, you know, get to your browser and look up a site called BibleGateway.com, which I, I recommend is a great site if you've never used it before. It's got, I don't know how many different versions of the Bible, and you can look up by chapter, verse, by topic. But if you were to just look up the phrase and search for the phrase, God is, um, you would come up with a lot of different descriptors of God. Now, first you'd have to um, call out the ones that, you know, like God is giving us the land or, you know, God is doing something. And just come down to the ones where it's God is an adjective or God is like a noun. You would come up with some of these kind of things that I've written down. Um, God is a witness, Genesis 31.50. God is not human, Numbers 23.19. God is near us whenever we pray to him, Deuteronomy 4.7. God is the king of all earth, Psalms 47.7. God is my salvation, Isaiah 12.2. God is merciful and forgiving, Dan 9.9. 9. God is truthful, John 3.3. 3. 
God is faithful, 1 Corinthians 10, 13. God is love, 1 John 4, 8. Those are all descriptions of God, but they're descriptions. They're, it's inspired because it's in the Bible, but they're descriptions that are written by men about God. Okay? Now, we're going to be looking at something a little bit different here in a minute. Um, you could get similar results uh, if you searched for the Lord is instead of God is. And when I say the Lord, you would put in the Lord all in caps. Now, I don't know. Most of you, I don't know if you've ever read the preface of your Bible, whatever version you have. But it can kind of be instructive because most prefaces to your Bible is going to have in there how they've translated into English the different words for God. Um, if it uses Elohim or Elohim, I'm probably mispronouncing that, that is translated as God. If it uses Adonai, that is translated as Lord, but it's translated as Lord with capital L, small O-R-D. But if it's the word Y-H-W-H, -H, which the Hebrews did not even pronounce, but we have transliterated that as Yahweh, and we've added a couple of vowels in there, then that is translated with all caps L-O-R-D. And the only exception to that would be where a writer puts Yahweh Adonai or Adonai Yahweh, and so you got Lord, Lord there, and so then it would, to avoid confusion, it would use Lord for Adonai with the small letters, and then it would translate uh, Yahweh as God. So it would say Lord God. So anytime you see Lord God, that God is probably in Hebrew was Yahweh, okay? Have I lost anybody yet? Anyway, all of that's in the preface of your Bible if you want to go back and review that. Um, so now we're going to look at more specifically what does God say about God. So if we turn to Exodus 34, the first four verses, the context here, chapter 32, was where Moses had gone up on Mount Sinai to get the tablets from God. Well, he didn't get the tablets. Well, maybe, I don't remember on that first set of tablets. Um, but he went to get the Ten Commandments from God that God wrote with his finger. And he comes down, and remember, his brother is worshiping the calf with the people. He gets angry. And what does he do to the tablets? If, you're, if you've watched, you know, Charlton Heston, you, you kind of have a picture in your mind of what, what he did with the tablets. Um, so now we're two chapters later. And in between this, God got angry at the people. He wanted to kill the people to destroy them, remember? Moses kind of talked God down from wanting to kill the people, but he did punish the people. We won't go into what the punishment was right now, but now we're in chapter 34. And the Lord said to Moses, chisel out two stone tablets like the first ones. So what he's saying is, bring me some more stationery. Because he's not going to write the Ten Commandments on it. Who's going to write the Ten Commandments? God, with his finger. Um, but he's going to bring the tablets to him. And I will write on them the words that were on the first tablets, which you broke. Be ready in the morning, and then come up on Mount Sinai. Present yourself to me there on top of the mountain. No one is to come with you or be seen anywhere on the mountain. So this is so holy, God saying, Nobody else is to come. Even the animals, you know, he's going to go on and say, not even the flocks and herds may graze in front of the mountain. So Moses chiseled out two stone tablets like the first ones and went up on Mount Sinai early in the morning as the Lord had commanded him, and he carried the two stone tablets in his hands. Okay. I got my slides out of order, so I'm going to have to come back to that one. <laughs> so Moses, I'm repeating verse 4, chiseled out the two stone tablets like the first ones and went to Mount Sinai early in the morning as the Lord had commanded him, and he carried them in his hands. Then the Lord came down in the cloud and stood there with him, Moses, and proclaimed his name, the Lord. 
Now see there, Lord is all in caps. So what is God's name that he's declaring to Moses? Yahweh. But they didn't say Yahweh. It was a name that only God said, and the, the, the Jews, out of respect and reverence for God, would never pronounce this name. And he tells him that's his name. And he passed in front of Moses proclaiming. So now the rest of this passage up here is God speaking to Moses, telling Moses about himself. The Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands and forgiving wickedness, rebellion, and sin. Yet he does not leave the guilty unpunished. He punishes the children and their children for the sin of the parents to the third and fourth generation. That's what the rest of our quarter is going to be about. We are going to take these different descriptions of God and we're going to look at other passages in the Bible that illustrate these different descriptions and look at what it is God's saying about himself that can tell us more about God and give us a deeper understanding of God. But this is not Moses talking about God. It's not an apostle talking about God. It's not David talking about God. This is God saying, introducing himself to Moses and saying, this is who I am. Okay? Questions? Now then, let me go backwards. And I, I was afraid, I, I tried to get four translations and I knew when I put four columns up here, this was gonna get awfully small. Um, let me just try and point out. The first column is NIV, which is what the class material is written in. The second column is New American Standard, which is what I usually use when I teach. The third column is uh, the English Standard Version, which is what a lot of our classes are in. And then the fourth column is King James Version, which is what some of you probably have sitting on your lap. So um, they're all pretty similar with the exception of the first verse is the same. The second verse, the Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God. NIV and NASB use compassionate, whereas the ESV and King James say merciful. So it's compassionate or merciful, abounding in love and faithfulness. Um, some of them say loving kindness and truth. Um, ESV says steadfast love and faithfulness. King James says goodness and truth. So two of them say faithfulness, two of them say truth. I find that is an interesting distinction, that faithfulness is equated to truthfulness, to truth. Okay. Verse 7, maintaining love in the NIV, loving kindness in the NASB, steadfast love in the ESV, and mercy in King James. All, that's all the same concept there. Three of them say forgiving iniquity, transgression, and sin. The NIV says forgiving wickedness, rebellion, and sin. They all say sin. Two of them say forgiving iniqui iniquity and transgression. The NIV, I kind of like it better. We don't use the word iniquity very often, you know, other than when you're reading in your Bible. I don't know if you've ever spoken to your children and said, you know, you disappointed me with your iniquity. You know, we don't use that word very often. Um, but wickedness and rebellion, those are words that we understand. We understand what rebellion means. We understand what wickedness means. And I'm not talking about the kind in the Broadway show Wicked. I'm talking about real wickedness, you know, downright being evil. That's wickedness. Okay, and then, yet he does not leave the guilty unpunished. Um, that's in NIV or NASB, but English Standard and King James says, clear the guilty. So one is unpunished and the other is, he doesn't leave them clear. Um, and then, punishes the sin of the parents in the NIV, and the other just says punishing the children or punishing the children or, and children's children or punishing the children and the grandchildren. So to the third and fourth generation. Now then, 
I have 12 lessons I've got to try and get through here. I've got 13 weeks, but then you've got to subtract next week when we've got a guest speaker. You've got to subtract the day before Thanksgiving, and you've got to subtract Christmas Day, which is a Wednesday this year. I didn't know that until I looked at my calendar preparing for this. So I'm down to 10 weeks that I've got to cover 12 lessons. It would be real easy for me to, to skip these last couple of verses, which is what the last two lessons are on, because those are the ones that most of us are scratching our heads and going, huh? Does God really do that? And what does that mean to me as a Christian? I may skip some other chat, some other, and these are all important, but I want to get to those because I think those are probably the ones that we have the most questions about. And I'm putting myself under the wire there, but we will get to those. Even if I have to talk to the teacher in the first quarter to giving me one of his weeks. So um, we'll get to those, okay? Questions at this point? Before I go on. I am excited about this. I don't know if that's coming across or not, but I was getting pumped thinking about studying this because I'm thinking, what better to know about God than what God says about himself? Okay. Now, there's somebody that did, I, I'm trying to stay away from theologians, but there's a guy that wrote a book called Old Testament Theology, and there's bunches of those books, but his name is John Goldingay, and he says in talking about these verses, of this list of qualities, he writes, God is not only able to be active, decisive, self-sufficient, controlling, tough, unchanging, but also to be acted upon, relational, flexible, sensitive, vulnerable, and risk-taking. Now then, again, we're, we're going back to what some, God is, what some guy is writing about God, but um, he writes this about this description that God gives of himself. Um, what do you notice after these four gentlemen introduce themselves about the way God introduces himself? Okay, he, he's telling qualities about himself. He starts off by giving his name, just like these four gentlemen did. They started with their names, and he gives his name, the Lord, and then he repeats it, the same word, the Lord. So it's both of those are Yahweh. So that's why it's not the Lord God, because it's not Adonai Yahweh, but it's Yahweh Yahweh. He, he starts by introducing himself. Why do you think God chooses this particular point in Israel's history to say these particular words about himself. What's just happened? Yes, Mike. Yeah, okay. Okay, he's reintroducing himself to show them that he's in control and for them to get their act together. I'm going to summarize what you said. If you go any farther, I'm not going to be able to remember everything, Zach, so I'm going to stop. But you're right. Okay, good point. Remember two, verses, two chapters before this, the people have just been about as sinful as they can be at a point when God has just been as revealing and as as he can, can be as a God. He's actually revealed himself to Moses, and he's given Moses something that is going to be the instructions for the people, you know, as long as they're his people. And I can see God being kind of excited about this chapter in history, and what did the people do to it? They stomp all over it. They say, we don't want that. Not in so many, they weren't thinking that, but that's just human nature. They just, out of sight, out of mind. Moses goes up on the mountain. He's not there anymore. And the people, we're not talking about years. We're not talking about generations. We're talking about minutes and hours. Yes.
Okay. So it's like the carrot and the stick is what, what he's saying to us. And so that's, um, how has God already demonstrated these qualities? And I don't just mean two chapters before, but I'm talking about from Genesis up to Exodus chapter 20, which is, you know, from uh, Adam to the patriarchal age. Remember, they're not to the promised land yet, so we don't have any kings. We're not, not dealing with any of those people. But the people that have, have come in history so far, how has God demonstrated these qualities to the people? He's held them accountable and wiped them out. You're thinking about Noah. Okay. That's, um, he does not leave the guilty unpunished. Okay, that's an example. Brought him out of Egypt. That's a compassionate and gracious God that's um, abounding in love and faithfulness. The Passover. The Passover as the event with the avenging angel that, yeah. And not leaving the guilty unpunished. To... Okay, even, yeah, even two chapters before when Moses had to talk God out of destroying the people. Okay, yeah, so we could think of, you know, we could, we could spend the rest of our class time this evening looking at examples, but you've, you've all hit on some good ones. Um, now then, what, call, what qualities, um, which of these qualities up here are comforting to you as a Christian? Compassionate? The whole first sentence? Okay, well, we'll, just, we'll just cut to the chase there. Compassionate, gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands. Well, that, that sentence goes on a long way. Yet, okay. Everything except until you get to the word yet. What up here is frightening? I've asked you comforting. What, what up here is frightening to you? The last sentence, okay. Okay. And you, know, you make a good point because that was one of my one of my coming up questions is which might not seem as apparent, and I'll get to what you're addressing there in just a minute on that. But are any of these confusing to you? Punishing the children—that's probably the most confusing to me. Um, punishing their children for the sin of the parents to the third and fourth generation, and that's—I promise I won't skip over that and say, "Oh, sorry, I'm out of time." <laughs> We're going to have to leave that one. Um, okay. What qualities of God would most people affirm easily? Compassionate, gracious, forgiving. Um, but what might not seem as um, apparent? And this is going to depend upon what your background is. If you happen to be um, someone who's suffering right now, you might have a hard time affirming that God is compassionate. You know, I don't know everybody's circumstances, but some people have a hard time when they're going through trials and they're suffering. Um, or some people, when they watch wicked people prospering, maybe in a rival business, maybe <laughs> their neighbor, I mean, I don't know the circumstances, but when they see wicked people prospering, they might have a hard time affirming that God does not let the guilty go unpunished. So sometimes we have problems with some of these things that are said about God. I'm not saying they're not true. I'm just saying sometimes we have to adjust our understanding of what these things say. What quality of God listed here do you, th do you most need today? I'm not going to ask you to answer that out loud, but just think to yourself. Which one up here do you need? If I was doing this, I thought I was teaching this on Sunday morning in the 
the other class, smaller group. And I was going to actually pass out name tags and have everybody put their name on. We were going to do the introduct introductory thing a little bit different and so forth. But at, that, at this point, I was going to ask everybody, take your name tag and write a characteristic up there that you need the most from God and put it on your name tag. You know, my name is Art and I need forgiveness. You know, my name is John Paul and I need uh, compassion, you know, whatever it might be that you need. And then we were going to take those name tags and put them on a board and we were going to pray for people. But go ahead. Okay. Right. Okay. Yeah. So what the point Nolan is making is that even though God spoke these words to Moses, Moses didn't actually see God face to face, that God, you know, you know, turned his back to Moses and Moses just saw God backside and then um, but even seeing that much of God when he came down what did the people see in Moses he was glowing yeah just being in the presence of God okay okay so at this point let's have a prayer dear Heavenly Father we thank you for your word but most especially we thank you for these words that are directly from you about you we know, Father, that you are compassionate, that you are forgiving, that you are gracious, that your love abounds for us. We pray, Father, that each one of us in our individual lives may have different needs right now, and only you and us know those needs, but we pray, Father, that you will meet those needs for us, that you will give us comfort and compassion if we need that, that you'll give us forgiveness if we need that and ask for it, that you will be merciful to us. Whatever characteristic of yours that we need, we know that you supply that to us if we but come to you in prayer and ask for it. And we pray all this in your son Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so. Exodus 34 continues. So God introduces himself to Moses, and Moses goes, okay. Now I've got an opportunity here. What's the first thing after God says all these things about himself, what is Moses' first reaction? To worship him. That should be our reaction when we read these characteristics of God to feel worshipful, to want to worship him. So he fell on the ground at once and worshiped. And then he went on. He said, Lord, now this is small ORD, so this is Adonai, he said, Lord, if, you have found, if I have found favor in your eyes, then let the Lord go with us. Although this is a stiff-necked people, forgive our wickedness and our sin. What's he doing here? He's quoting God <laughs> and what God said he was, that he was a God that forgave wickedness and sin. And take us as your inheritance. So he's saying, okay, I believe this about you, but now show me. Take us back as your people. We're stiff-necked, we're stubborn, we're going to make mistakes, we're going to fall. Boy, did they fall <laughs> over and over and over. You know, forgive our wickedness. And then 11 and 12 and 14, God responds. And, and I've cut out some of this for some, some time, but I'm just looking at three verses here. Then the Lord said in response to Moses, I am making a covenant with you. Before all your people, I will do wonders never before done in any nation in all the world. And we're going to see that as they go into the promised land and as they become his people. And the people you live among will see how awesome is the work that I, the Lord, Yahweh, will do for you 
Obey what I command you today. I will drive out before you the Amorites, Canaanites, Hittites, Perizzites, Hivites, and I skipped a couple of verses. Do not worship any other God, for the Lord whose name is Jealous is a jealous God. Now, we aren't going to talk about jealous in our lessons. I've, I've got too much to cover already, but these are, this is a promise God makes to the people here through Moses. Okay? Now then, he makes this promise to Moses. They get to the promised land. He says, I'm going to drive out all these people. He doesn't just say, I'm going to drive out all the ones that are under six feet tall. He says, I'm going to drive them all out. And they go into the land, and what's their response? Ten of the twelve spies. So, yeah, it doesn't take very long, but they, they're going to turn away from God again. Okay. Now then. Something I would like to do sometime in each of our classes is I would like for us to repeat, not the part that's underlined, but repeat verses 6 and 7 out loud together. We have our little kids do memory verses. I'm going to give you guys a memory verse. One memory verse, two verses. We're going to practice it 10, 11 weeks. We'll see if we can get it down. Um, and then before I forget, next week we're going to be looking at these two verses, but also... Uh, please read Numbers 14, verses 1 through 25. And that will be where we will be talking about one of these characteristics of God. It's going to show us where Moses receives his request and more in Numbers 14. Okay. So, let's begin. The Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness maintaining love to thousands and forgiving wickedness, rebellion, and sin. Yet he does not leave the guilty unpunished. He punishes the children and their children for the sin of the parents to the third and fourth generation. Thank you. You've been a good class. Any questions? Comments? Numbers 14, the first 25 verses, 1 through 25. Thank you for asking. Yes, Larry. Yeah. Yes. Larry makes an excellent point. Thank you for making that. In that part of the description of God as a jealous God, there's a selfish kind of jealousy and an unselfish kind of jealousy. And he's pointing out that this description of God is an unselfish type of jealousy. And uh, that it's an excellent lesson in and of itself, but I'm going to run out of time as it is. And I want to get to these third and fourth generation questions. <laughs> I have read ahead, so uh, I just want to make sure we get to it. Thank you for your comment. That was a very good one. Not that all comments aren't good. Okay, I think I've got just a few seconds before the second bell is going to ring. I was told class gets over at 740. I thought I had an extra five minutes. so I was kind of rushing there. I want to make sure I got all the way through. Thank you very much for your attention. I hope you're back next week and bring somebody with you. Let's have a good class.